All right. Uh, hello and welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm John MacArthur, the Sustainable Transportation Program Manager uh, at TREC, and I will be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our Friday Transportation Seminar have been a tradition since 2000. These seminars are usually held live at Portland State University's urban campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kualamit, Clackamas, Tumwater, Walala, Bands of the Chinook, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced on the indigenous ancestors of this place, remember these communities, and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, today's seminar will be hosted fully online. Today, we are pleased to have Jamie Volker presenting on Reckoning with Induced tra uh, Vehicle Travel. Dr. Jamie Volker is a postdoctoral researcher with the National Center for Sustainable Transportation at UC Davis, and he studies transportation and housing policy and land use and environmental law. Before jumping into the seminar, I'd like to share some information about upcoming uh, Friday trans, uh, transportation seminars. We are very excited about them and hope you will be able to attend them. The next one is uh, February 18th. As an overview of today's seminar, you can expect our speaker to present for about 40 minutes, followed by Q&A. You will be receiving questions, we will be receiving questions through a Q&A feature on your control panel and we'll ask them at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time for all your questions, we will give our speaker the opportunity to email written responses to any questions left unanswered. We have enabled closed captioning, but you must click the CC feature on the control panel to view them. We will be recording today's webinar and it will be available on our website later today along with presentation slides. If you are tra tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. And with that, I will hand it over to Jamie. All right, thanks so much, John. Uh, let me share my screen here. Make sure this works. All right. Does that look good to you, John, Becca? It does. All right, great. All right, so as, as John mentioned, I'm gonna be talking today about the uh, hot topic of, of induced travel. And uh, let's just jump right in. All right, so quick overview of what I'm gonna be covering today. So I'll start out with a, a primer on induced travel. So I'll talk a little bit about our historical approach to congestion management, um, how induced travel factors into that, and the behavioral and economic basis for induced travel, um, explain that a little bit using some examples. Then I'm going to talk about the evidence from the empirical research, what kind of magnitude we see with induced travel. And then I'll follow that up with talking about an induced, the induced travel calculators that my colleagues and I have developed for estimating uh, induced travel on the project level. And then I'll talk about how uh, induced travel has been incorporated or not, as the case um, has often been, in the environmental and review and cost benefit analyses for um, capacity, roadway capacity expansion projects. And then I'll conclude with some next steps that researchers and practitioners can take to better understand the, um, the true impacts of, of roadway expansion. All right, so let's start by looking at the historical approach to congestion management. So for decades and decades, the most common approach to addressing roadway congestion um, and the problems associated with it has been to increase roadway capacity by either building new roads or adding lanes to existing roads. 
Um, and that has both intuitive and political appeal, right? I mean, intuitively, we've all sat in uh, in traffic and thought, you know, if there were just one more lane, we'd be we'd be moving a whole lot faster. And that tends to be true in the short term, right after the the roadway is expanded. Um, you know, we see a little bit short term um, increase in speed, um, shorter wait times, less congestion. Um, and politically, it's an easily digestible and widely accepted solution that, you know, provides ribbon cutting opportunities for politicians, along with some immediate results, um, while conveniently, of course, kicking the, the congestion can down the road for the next elected official. Um, but the problem is, is that adding uh, capacity often does not end in this steady state of reduced congestion and faster speeds. So it has actually the unintended effect of inducing more auto travel on the expanded corridor um, and overall uh, a net increase across the entire roadway network. So this is the effect that we refer to as induced travel. Increased capacity, it increases the speed reduces congestion initially, and then ultimately that leads to more driving. So it's you know where you add a lane, you ultimately end up with more driving, more vehicle miles traveled, which is a term I'll refer to a lot today, vehicle miles traveled, VMT. Um, but you ultimately end up with similar levels of congestion. Uh, and that can start the whole cycle over again. So we have kind of where endless Capacity expansion induces more VMT, yet doesn't reduce congestion much, if at all, in the long run. All right, so that's kind of how uh, induced travel fits into this historical approach to congestion management. But, but why, why does induced travel happen? Uh, what mechanisms are at play? Well, the induced travel effect can be explained by basic economic principles of, of supply and demand. So as the cost of a good decreases, consumption of that good generally increases. And the same tends to be true uh, with driving. So one way that driving can become cheaper is when roadway capacity is added in congested areas, areas with minimal accessibility, or areas with unsafe or low speed roads. So that reduces the, the time cost of driving, at least initially, uh, because it reduces congestion or otherwise makes it faster and easier to access places along the expanded route. So in turn, though, the reduction in the cost of driving leads to increased consumption. Uh, it increases vehicle miles traveled. And you know, more specifically, the reduced cost of driving leads to both short term and longer term behavioral changes that increase VMT. So in the shorter term, um, People take advantage of the reduced cost of driving to make longer trips, uh, more frequent trips, shifting modes, um, maybe from transit or active travel to, to driving, and also shifting routes, um, sometimes taking a longer route, a scenic route to get somewhere. And then in the longer term, you actually have an, an increased demand uh, for driving, uh, an increased structural demand, and that's due to households and businesses relocating throughout the metro area um, in response to this initially improved auto mobility. So maybe moving further out from the metro center because, and at least initially, it takes you know, the same amount of time to get to the metro center um, from five miles out as it, as it originally took from, from just one mile out. Um, and you also uh, find that this improved automobility, the reduced cost of, of driving in an area, can induce migration to the area in the long term, which of course increases demand as well. So let me just explain this here with a, with a hypothetical scenario uh, to illustrate all of this. So I'm going to use the, the Sacramento area in California. Um, all right, so we have downtown Sacramento here on the right. And we have the UC Davis campus and the city of Davis here on the left. So which is about 15 miles um, to the west of, of downtown Sacramento. So I actually live in Boston right now um, and work remotely at UC Davis. Um, but for the sake of this example, let's assume I move back to Davis for work, um, get a new job there that requires me to be in person. Um, and the problem though, is that, you know, while I have a great new job at Davis and I love my quaint little house near downtown, 
I'm not so enamored of the restaurant and nightlife options there. Um, so, you know, not too great. And that's speaking from personal experience, not the best. Um, downtown Sacramento, by contrast, does have some very good restaurants and breweries, you know, much better than your average fare at Davis. Um, and so at the end of my first grueling week at my new hypothetical job in Davis, you know, I'd really like to take a load off and meet some friends for, for dinner and a beer. Uh, and so I think about going to Sacramento. And so I pull up Google Maps right here um, and I check out my options and I see that it'll likely take me between 30 minutes and an hour to get to downtown Sacramento due to Friday evening traffic. You know, yikes, like I don't, I don't wanna be traveling 30 minutes to an hour, uh, let alone do so in traffic and just, you know, increase my blood pressure all the way to the restaurant. Like that doesn't sound great. Um, so, you know, much, much longer than I was hoping for. Uh, and, and driving for that long just sounds like the opposite of relaxing. So I'm about to call it quits, make dinner at home. When I remember that Amtrak uh, actually runs a, a pretty decent service from, from Davis to Sacramento. So I checked the timing there. So a little bit better, right? 35 to 40 minutes, maybe, if I actually catch the train on time. Um, but still, that sounds a little bit longer than I want to travel. Uh, so I end up just staying home. You know, staying home, making dinner for myself, and sadly scrolling through Instagram pics of my friends in Sacramento, uh, having a great time. Uh, and so after a couple more Fridays at home like that, you know, I, I just can't stand the FOMO anymore. I decide to bite the bullet and take the train, despite it taking, you know, 30 to, to 45 minutes. Um, I still don't like traveling for much more than 15 to 20 minutes on a Friday night though. So I end up only going out to Sacramento about once a month via train and staying at home or reluctantly rehashing the Davis eatery options the, the rest of the time. All right, so now that I've decided, you know, to take the train, I'm, I'm taking the train to Sacramento you know, once a month on a Friday. All right, but then something truly amazing happens. You know, there's so many, with so many people pissed off about the congestion on the I-80 corridor between Davis and Sacramento, they decide to expand capacity by adding two lanes. Like, this is just amazing, right? And it cuts my travel time, um, according to, to Google Maps, by nearly 50%. So now I can make it in close to 20 minutes. Um, and that's right about the, the amount of time I'd like to spend um, traveling on a, on a Friday on a Friday night. So with this newfound automobility, I give up my once monthly train trip and start driving to Sacramento two to three Fridays a month. So now, now I'm really a happy camper, but I'm not destined to stay this happy for long. And that's because I'm not the only one doing this. Uh, other people are also making more or further trips by car to take advantage of the increased automobility on the I-80 corridor. Um, and some people are also switching from transit to car trips, just like, just like I did. Uh, indeed, you know, you can expect that due to the reduced travel time, some people are even deciding to move from Sacramento to Davis for a little more peace and quiet, um, despite the additional commute back to Sacramento. And so this, this what was going on right here is, is induced travel. Um, and these are just some examples of ways in which expanding roadway capacity can induce additional automobile travel. So here, right, I ended up both making more trips to Sacramento and switching modes from Amtrak to my personal car. And other people ended up doing the same thing as well. Um, and some people, as I mentioned, even moved further from their jobs as a result of the initially reduced travel times so they could live in a nice quaint neighborhood in Davis that they liked more, just like I do. Um, and, all right, so, so that's kind of conceptually what's going on, what's the behavioral aspects, what, what the capacity expansion can trigger in, in someone's day-to-day um, -day behavior and their long-term decisions as well. So let's look at this from a supply and demand perspective as well. All right, so here we have just your run of the mill supply and demand graph. On the, on the y-axis, you have the cost of driving, um, i.e. time. And on the x-axis, you have volume of driving um, and vehicle miles traveled or VMT. And so you have the, the demand curve uh, is downward sloping. So as the cost of driving decreases, 
the volume of driving increases. So it's exactly what happened in my hypothetical example, the cost of driving from Davis to Sacramento decreased. And so the volume of, of driving increased. Um, the supply curve goes the opposite way, of course. So as the volume of driving increases, the cost of driving increases. And that makes sense. As more people are driving, the, the time it takes to get from one place to another um, increases. Uh, so the effective cost increases. All right. And so you have your equilibrium here where the supply and demand curves meet. And so this is your initial volume of, of, of driving, um, VMT uh, zero. So what happens when you expand the roadway capacity in the area? So what that does is increases capacity and lowers the time cost of driving for, for any given volume of driving. And so it pushes this supply curve out and you find a new equilibrium point here further to the right, um, V1. And so the difference here between V1 and V is what we might call the, the short run um, induced travel. So the, the increase in VMT from V to V1 it is due to those short-term um, behavioral changes that I, that I mentioned. So people taking longer trips, more frequent trips, um, shifting modes or, or shifting routes. And then in the longer term, you have an additional um, induced, uh, induced VMT, additional induced travel. And this is due to the structural shifts in the demand that I had mentioned. So where you have um, businesses and, and households relocating throughout the metro area, further from the metro center, and people actually migrating into the area to take advantage of the initially improved automobility. And so this here, you have your total induced travel, your total long-term induced travel is V2 minus V. Um, and this component, uh, the additional component that happens in the long term is what we would refer to as induced demand. So this long run component of induced travel is what we call induced demand, where the demand curve actually shifts out um, due to people increasing their baseline um, demand for, for driving and because more actors have moved into the area, um, increasing, increasing demand. All right, so, so that's kind of the basics of how and why induced travel happens. So the next question is, how is induced travel quantified? And, and what does the empirical research tell us about the, the magnitude of, of induced travel? All right, so the, the magnitude of induced travel, of the induced travel effect is, is usually measured as an elasticity. Um, i.e. the ratio of the percentage change in VMT to the percentage change in lane miles caused by a capacity expansion project. So an, for an example, an elasticity of 1.0 means that a 10% increase in, in lane miles would cause a 10% increase in, in VMT. And in general, that is what the empirical research estimates, an elasticity of close to 1.0, at least for expansions on major roadways like freeways, highways, and major arterials, um, and especially those in, in metropolitan areas. Um, so here's just, just a, a taste of the empirical uh, research, empirical evidence that's out there. So these are some of the most and, and most statistically, most recent and most um, statistically sound uh, empirical studies on induced travel that estimate elasticities of VMT with respect to lane miles in the in the United States. So you can see um, that the elasticities bolded here on the left in the left hand column range from a low of about 0 0.7 to a high of over 1.0. Um, and I didn't include here, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I didn't include more parochial studies at the state level or regional level from the US or studies outside of the US. But, but the results, um, at least for the more statistically robust studies, tend to be, tend to be similar. Uh, for example, uh, for those curious about what's going on outside of the US, research has estimated elasticities of about 1.0 um, 
or of at least 1.0 actually in in Japan and the um, you know 545 biggest cities in Europe. So this isn't just a U.S. phenomenon. It's not just one state. Um, it, it happens all over the place. It's a, a pretty widespread phenomenon. All right, so what, what the empirical research indicates is that there is about a one-to-one -one relationship in relative magnitude um, between capacity expansions on major roadways and increases um, in VMT. And uh, what that means for congestion is that it is unlikely to be relieved by increasing highway capacity. So this is a point that um, Susan Handy colleague at, at UC Davis, who's worked with me a lot on this, made in a policy brief um, back in 2015. So it's not, it's not new, but it's gained a lot of traction here recently and um, around induced travel. Um, and, so, and so you might say, okay, hold up, you know, okay, an elasticity 1.0, well, that, that's only for general purpose lanes, right? Uh, you know, what about managed lanes, like carpool lanes, high occupancy toll lanes, um, or, or pure toll lanes, you know, well, we'd expect induced travel there too, because you're still expanding the roadway supply and reducing the cost of driving for at least some drivers. So you can still expect to have behavioral change, similar behavioral changes, maybe not to the same magnitude, but that's something I'll talk about right now. So there hasn't been much research on how exactly the elasticities might differ for the different types of lanes. However, the studies I just mentioned um, in the table in the previous slide, uh, the ones I just summarized, they all included some managed lanes, um, especially HOV lanes, in addition to general purpose lanes in, in the data they used to, to estimate the, the elasticities. Um, in addition, I, I wanted to highlight a recent study by Michael Anderson and uh, his colleagues at UC Berkeley where they looked at uh, induced travel from four highway capacity expansion projects in California, three of which added new managed lanes. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of their study, but suffice it to say that uh, they concluded that, quote, overall, we find that the implied elasticities are similar across different types of lane expansions, so in that case, that included general purpose, HOV, and HOT lanes. Um, and in all cases, within the range of estimates from previous studies. So here we have a, a good amount uh, or an increasing amount of evidence that the elasticities are similar for capacity expansions with general purpose, um, HOV, and HOT lanes. This is something that we need more research on, but you know, we have some evidence that we can expect um, similar elasticities. Now, I will say that this might be a different, uh, a different answer for strictly toll lanes. Um, and there's, the answer there really depends on what you set the toll at. Um, you would expect at least a little bit of induced travel because more people are, you know, more people are, some people are gonna take advantage of that toll lane and that's going to open up capacity on the on the other lanes, which um, you know reduced reduced cost of driving on those other lanes. That's going to induce travel there. So there's going to be at least some induced travel, um, but really how much will depend a lot on what the toll is set at. And and so you know more research is needed there too um, across different types of of tolling structures. Um, but you know. Some evidence here, a lot of evidence for general purpose and HOV lanes, some evidence for HOT lanes that there's a pretty sizable elasticity around 1.0 um, for increases in capacity. All right, so, so if the empirical research is indicating that, that roadway expansions are, are frequently going to lead us here, you know, right back to the congested conditions we started with, but with more VMT, which is not good for our air quality or greenhouse gas emission reduction goals, um, th then why are we so frequently stuck in this feedback loop, this rut of, of trying to build our way out of congestion? And the answer is, is that we historically have just not done a good job of accounting for induced travel when forecasting the traffic effects of, um, of roadway expansions. Um, now you might be thinking, 
you know, don't travel demand models already capture the induced travel effect in their forecast? Isn't that what they're there for? And, and yes and no. Um, the answer is that generally they don't fully capture the effect. Um, and so many models, you know, particularly traditional four-step travel demand models, do not include all the feedback loops that are necessary to, to capture the behavioral changes caused by capacity expansion. So for example, not many models feed changes in estimated travel times back into the trip distribution or trip generation stages of the model, which ignores the possibility that improved travel times from a capacity expansion, you know, initially improved travel times will um, in turn increase the number of trips that households and freight operators choose to make um, or cause them to, to choose more distant trip destinations. Um, neither do, do most models feed changes in estimated travel times back into assumptions about the growth and distribution of population and employment. Though I will say there have been improvements here um, with land use modeling tools like, like urban sim. Um, in addition, you know, travel demand models, the results can be very noisy for, for smaller capacity expansion projects. And this is especially true with um, activity-based models that do a better job of incorporating um, induced, accounting for induced travel, but they are quite noisy for, um, for smaller capacity expansion projects. Um, and another issue is that the models can also be expensive and time consuming to run. And so all of that has led to environmental and cost benefit analyses failing to fully account for, um, for induced travel um, in a lot of cases. And so that's why my colleagues and I at the National Center for Sustainable Transportation at UC Davis decided to develop um, the induced travel calculator uh, to help better inform environmental and cost benefit analyses for roadway uh, expansion projects. So the, the calculator, which we originally developed for, for California is, is a simple online sketch tool. So it's a, it's a back of the envelope calculator that provides an order of magnitude estimate of induced VMT using elasticity estimates from the, the peer reviewed um, empirical research that I was just talking about. Um, as well as roadway data from Caltrans, um, roadway data on existing lane miles and existing VMT. And the, the calculator applies to, applies to a wide array uh, of roadway capacity expansion projects. So it applies to projects that would add general purpose lanes, high occupancy vehicle lanes, or high occupancy toll lanes, um, to, to major publicly managed roadways in the state. And so what I mean by uh, major, major roadways, um, we define those as roadways in Federal Highway Administration class one, two, or three. So what those are is class one facilities or interstate highways, I-5, for example, um, uh, and class two facilities are other freeways and expressways, including US routes and many state routes. And then class three facilities are, are other principal arterials. All right, um, in terms of geography, the NCST calculator is currently restricted to projects located in California's 37 urbanized counties. So counties within a metropolitan statistical area. But, you know, we've also helped develop uh, calculators for areas outside of California. So uh, I'm not just going to sit here and tell you about a calculator that only applies in California, might not apply for you. Um, here is an example. Most recently, we, we worked with the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, NRDC and Transportation for America to develop a nationwide calculator. So it's called the shift calculator. And it works essentially the same way as our original California calculator, um, just with additional data from all, all 50 states, as well as DC and Puerto Rico. And so the, the shift calculator, um, in addition uh, to providing induced travel estimates, it also provides an estimate of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with, uh, with the induced VMT. 
All right, so let's go through an example of how this works. So now, since this is you know, a presentation for Portland State, I figured we could use the, the calculator to see how much induced VMT uh, we could expect from the I-5 Rose Quarter project that's uh, proposed right in your backyard. All right, so here is a screenshot of uh, the, the calculator, the front, front page on the calculator website. And you can see you only need um, four inputs to be able to calculate the, the induced travel from a proposed capacity expansion project. So first you have to select a state, obviously here it's Oregon. Um, then you choose your, your type of road. So in this case, um, we're using the, the Rose Quarter uh, project on I-5. So it's an interstate highway. And then you are going to choose uh, the urbanized area or the county in this case, because it's a class one facility, um, we choose the metropolitan statistical area that the project is located in. And so obviously that is the Portland, Vancouver, Hillsboro um, MSA. And then we need to input the total lane miles. And so I think this is kind of up in the air as to exactly how many lane miles the Rose Quarter project would add. I just used here the most conservative estimate um, possible, which would just be adding one lane um, to in each direction for the approximately 1.5 mile long project. So two lanes added for 1.5 miles equals um, three total lane miles added. And so then all you do is hit this calculate VMT button, which is right below this last input. And voila, you know, the calculator estimates that uh, using an elasticity of 1.0 that the Rose Porter project would induce um, would induce 16 to 23 million additional uh, VMT per year. And uh, with an associated cumulative emission through 2050 of 0.1 to uh, 0.2 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Um, and so those numbers would be obviously even higher if we assume that the project would add more than just two lanes. Um, but still, even with just adding one lane in each direction for 1.5 miles, it's an astronomical amount of induced VMT. So uh, I, I recently saw that the director of the Federal Highway Administration rescinded his approval of the environmental review, the, the EA and the FONSI for, for the Rose Quarter project. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, how ODOT addresses uh, induced, induced travel um, in, its, in its revised analysis. I mean, I know there's a lot of local watchdogs holding ODOT's feet to the fire on this. Um, but on the other hand, there's not a great track record of, of NEPA and other environmental review documents accounting for, for induced travel. Um, and that's something that my colleagues and I at UC Davis recently did a, a little study on. So, so after we built the California um, induced travel calculator, um, my colleagues Amy Lee and Susan Handy and I used the calculator to, to help assess how well the environmental review documents for a sample of, of five major capacity expansion projects in California addressed um, induced VMT. And unsurprisingly, we found that they did not do a great job. So in terms of quantitative analysis, um, only three of the five documents um, reported estimates of, of induced VMT. And all three estimates were, were lower than what, what we estimated using the, using the calculator. Um, as you can see here in the, the light blue bars versus the dark blue bars. The dark blue bars are the estimates that, that we came up with with the induced travel calculator based on the empirical, um, empirical research. And here the light blue um, were the reported induced travel numbers in the environmental review document um, using different methods. And you know all so all three estimates were lower um, than what we estimated in the calculator, and two of them were were an order of magnitude lower. So 
very big difference. Um, uh, you know, overall, our results provided additional evidence that the environmental analyses have often failed to consistently discuss, let alone estimate um, the induced travel effects uh, of highway capacity expansion projects. And we also found with that study uh, that frequently induced travel just wasn't mentioned at all until someone in the public brought it up in, in, a, in a public comment. And then it was addressed in a response to comments and often the way that induced travel was, was addressed, um, it conflicted with, with the, the literature on, um, on induced travel. And sometimes it was even internally inconsistent within the environmental review document it's, itself. Um, but I think, you know, as induced travel has gotten a lot more attention um, in recent years, even in the seven years since, um, since Dr. Handy wrote that, that policy brief that I, that I showed a, a screenshot of earlier, um, we're getting you know, better understanding of, of the induced travel concept. And we're actually finding that the, the beginnings of a kind of a sea change in how induced travel is incorporated by, um, by policymakers and by analysts um, for, for proposed new projects. So, you know, things are starting to change. Um, uh, in California, it's been uh, wonderful to, to see what's been happening recently. Um, in September 2020, Caltrans came out with its first ever transportation analysis framework. Um, and in this that document, uh, they, they recommend using our, uh, our California calculator, the NCST calculator, as the go-to method for estimating induced travel, induced VMT from um, capacity expansion projects on the state highway, in the state highway system. Um, at the very least, they recommend using it as, using the induced travel calculator estimates as a benchmark um, with which to judge the, the sufficiency of travel demand model estimates. And so this is still in the early phases of, of project analyses actually um, working with this within this framework, um, but we are starting to see a, a recognition um, amongst analysts, amongst policymakers that induced travel is an issue, that we need to address it, and that we should be looking towards the, the empirical evidence on induced travel, which as I mentioned shows, at least in metropolitan areas for major roadways, an elasticity of about 1.0. Um, and we're hearing a lot of interest in other states too about better accounting for induced travel. Um, so it's, it's a pretty exciting time um, to be amidst this, this sea change that, that's happening. And I hope that it, that it continues because it is a, a big impact that has been um, underestimated or misestimated for, for a very long time. It affects both the costs and the benefits of, of proposed capacity expansions. Um, Benefits, obviously, if you're not going to reduce the congestion, the benefits of the project are lower and costs. If you're inducing more VMT, you're creating more air pollution, more greenhouse gas emissions, um, more people stuck in cars for a long time, um, all the stress that, that causes and, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, so there's optimism abounding, but at the same time, changing and trends practices and the belief that we can build our way out of congestion is, is no simple task. Um, and a lot of work remains. I just wanna give an example from a recent study by, by my colleagues, Nick Klein, uh, Kelsey Ralph, Calvin Thigpen and, and Ann Brown. And they found that only about one third of US adults um, understood the induced travel phenomenon. Um, and that's not surprising. It's not necessarily the most intuitive concept to understand but it highlights that there is a major information problem um, that, that remains. And, and beyond that major communication gap, there also remains a lot of research, um, a lot, of, a lot of, of things that could be done um, by researchers and practitioners to better understand the true impacts of, of roadway expansion. Um, and so I'll, I'll end with some next steps towards that end, towards better understanding the true impacts of roadway expansion. All right, so as I, 
mentioned earlier, you know, we do need more empirical research on induced travel, especially on managed lanes. So I mentioned, yes, there's very good evidence that, um, that uh, there's an induced travel on general purpose and HO, well, especially general purpose lanes of, of 1.0. Um, and there's increasing evidence that the elasticities are similar for HOV and HOT lanes. Um, but we need more more studies on this. We need we need more evidence to to fully flesh this out. Um, we need also more empirical research on the effects of removing lanes um, or or roads. Um, and so this has been highlighted uh, recently by the Reconnecting Communities Program and the Infrastructure Investment and, and Jobs Act that was just signed into law. So there's money as part of that program that's going to help fund removal of certain highway segments um, across the US. And so it would be great to be able to estimate, you know, what could we expect when that happens? Can we expect a VMT reduction? If so, how much? And associated benefits of potentially improved air quality um, and, and the like. So we, we need to look at that. Um, we also need to uh, better account for induced travel in travel demand models. As, as I mentioned there, we've been making good strides there with activity-based models um, and with incorporating land use changes through things like urban sim, but a lot more work uh, remains, remains to be done there. Um, and I also wanted to, to highlight more broadly that we, we need a better understanding and uh, daylighting really of the other, you know, long ignored impacts of, of roadway expansion, like um, displacement and air quality impacts that have fallen disproportionately on, on lower income and black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Um, this is just, I mean, we know a lot about this, but it, it really hasn't been brought to, to the limelight very well um, yet. Um, however, I do want to give a shout out here um, for one, one effort that has been doing a great job of, um, of, of pulling in the relevant research and, and putting together a compelling story that, that conveys all of this. So Streets for All, um, they have a Destruction for Nada campaign in Los Angeles, and they did an incredible job conveying many of these issues uh, in a very visually compelling uh, 10 minute, very digestible video. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, very good work there. And it just highlights a lot of the, the academic research that's been done here. Um, and uh, which, you know, we need more of that. And we also just need better storytellers um, for it all. All right, so, and with that, you know, that concludes my presentation. I'd love to uh, to hear your thoughts and take your questions. Hey, thank you, uh, uh, Jamie. <clears throat> For those viewing the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A feature in the control panel on the bottom of the Zoom screen. And, you know, I'll start with a, a question. You, um, We were talking before the webinar uh, about you having some conversations at the federal level. You know, a lot of these, you know, issues particularly pertain to federally funded projects. Like, what is the conversation happening at the federal level? And what are opportunities where we can start including this, you know, on those type of projects? What would it, what would it take to change FHWA to get these rolled out through the federal process? Yeah, I think... I mean, we got the, the ball rolling there with this national nationwide calculator and it, it uses the data um, from, from FHWA um, that is submitted to them by the State Departments of Transportation for all the states. So it's, it's using this federal data um, and um, provides an opportunity for, for Departments of Transportation across the U.S. to, to estimate induced travel um, in, a, in a similar fashion. So we now give them a way to do that. And now what I think would be a great next step is for the, the DOT to federal DOT to, to change their, their guidance for, for NEPA, for National Environmental Policy Act um, reviews and say, okay, we need to make sure that when we're doing capacity expansion projects, we need to, to look at induced travel and develop um, guidance maybe similar to what Caltrans has done in California and say, okay, 
you know, there might be other ways for doing this. You could use a travel demand model, but you should benchmark it against what the empirical research has shown. Great. And um, I just want to acknowledge uh, Jennifer Dill, uh, the director of uh, Trek, has joined uh, us uh, from another uh, meeting, important meeting. But uh, Jennifer, do you have a, a question that you're going to Pose. I, I'm going to start using some of the questions in our audience. Um, and uh, my apologies for joining late. Um, great content from the part that I, I did see, and I'll go back and watch the whole thing afterwards. Um, I'm just going to start at the top and some of the earlier questions. And, and um, we have a question from Eric Fruits referring to slide 15 that gets at this issue of consumer surplus. Um, and so um, on that slide, he notes that consumer surplus is larger after the capacity expansion than before. Um, and so um, I think the crux of the question is, what does the evidence say on the user benefits of adding capacity and sort of how does that fit into this discussion? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, uh, so, you know, after you add capacity, you're going to have just, just more people driving, um, and there is going to be some utility with that, but it, that doesn't, that doesn't change the fact that once, you know, after five or 10 years, you're going to get back to the same congestion levels. And so you're going to have similar time delay problems. Um, you're going to have even more environmental impacts uh, from this additional driving. And so there might be some additional utility from, from, from more people being able to drive, um, you know, even in congested conditions than, than we're able to before. Uh, but the induced travel calculator and the research is all about under, better understanding the costs associated with that and better understanding that you're not going to get quite the degree of benefits that that we used to think we would. Great, and um, I'm going to ask a question. We had a, a, a clarification question, and this kind of relates to our Rose Quarter issue. Um, uh, questions about how the calculator addresses auxiliary and traveling capacity are they different? Is it basically considered the same? Can we can the calculator deal with the difference of those type of uh, uses or lane expansions? Yeah, it, I mean, it would be basically considered the same unless there was some um, very strict use restrictions on an, on an auxiliary lane. But in a lot of cases, the auxiliary lane basically acts as another travel lane. Um, and so you would expect the same kind of induced travel, the same magnitude of induced travel in, in those situations. Um, and I, I believe everyone can see the question, so I, I'm I'm sometimes shortening these um, for uh, our time. And there's a question about the calculators and whether or not um, yours or any other one, things that you've looked at incorporate equity factors. And you sort of brought that up in your conclusions that sometimes there are disproportionate um, impacts on um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So can you speak to that? Yeah, so that's a very good question, and, and and that's why I think we do need more research and 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 just storytellers who can tie all of these things together. We don't currently in the calculators have um, have any estimation of of, of equity impacts, um, but it is something that I would recommend looking at if you're going to look at the impacts of a project. You could look at where this project's gonna happen, the calculate the induced travel, and then what are the sequelae from that? What is the additional um, air quality impacts? Um, you know, what, what's the composition of the, of the neighborhoods that, that uh, live right next to this capacity expansion? They're gonna be the ones bearing the brunt of that um, in, increased air quality, um, as well as any displacement, obviously, that would happen, um, like from the current highway expansion projects proposed in, in Houston. Uh, a lot of displacement would, uh, would occur there. So um, I think it's, it's one tool that can help better understand equity impacts because it's giving you a better idea of, of the, the VMT and associated air quality impacts, but the calculators right now don't explicitly tie into equity. That's a, a further step that you would have to take. 
Great. Um, you know, you, you talked about some studies looking at um, induced travel, uh, particularly related to managed lanes. Um, as you, you probably know up here, we have the urban growth boundary and we, and we do some very progressive land use. Uh, did you look at or find any studies that looked at uh, induced travel as it relates to land use or would be you know, our, uh, our urban growth boundary and how that might impact? That's a really, that's a very good question. And no, um, I have not seen a study that, that looks at differences based on um, urban growth boundaries or other type of um, land use growth management strategies. That's another area in which uh, it could be useful to, to, see, to see new research on that. Um, it, it's certainly possible that with, with the growth management boundary, I mean, in that case, maybe you'll even see in uh, land use changes going further out, you know, like beyond the growth management boundary to where growth can occur. Um, so it's there. I, I would say there's no clear answer. It would, it would depend on the strategy. But yeah, that's. We it would be interesting to get to do more studies comparing different types of conditions. I mean, so far most of the studies haven't been able to do that. I mean, you really need just a huge amount of data to be able to estimate an elasticity. And so when you when you do that, uh, especially in these national studies, you you can lose some. Um, ability to 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 differentiate based on on local context, but there are ways in which you could do um, studies where you're comparing one area versus another um, on these type of issues. I'm going to try to combine a couple questions that focused in on the elasticity part of the calculator, um, and one was. Um, sort of a more narrow question about with an elasticity of 1.0, doesn't the calculator just give back the average lane volume times the length of the segment? And then perhaps a broader um, related to that is that choice of 1.0 and are there examples of places that might have higher or lower elasticities depending on the context? Yeah, that's another, uh question that that we've seen come up a lot and so the one the one point out elasticity so that you take the the percentage change in lane miles within the given geography and the way the way the calculator works for um, a capacity expansion on an interstate you look at the the number of interstate lane miles just the lane miles in that same functional class within the relevant geography so for the rose porter expansion you'd look at um, interstate lane miles within the, you know, Portland area um, MSA. And so it's adding, you know, three lane miles. So you, you'd look at what's the percentage change there in, in the lane miles on interstates within the, the MSA. And then you'd apply that same percentage to whatever the existing VMT is. Um, and, and so that's how you arrive at that number. And, and yes, these are um, these are average elasticities uh, across um, a whole host of contexts. Um, but these studies that have done the elasticities, you know, they don't account for every little thing, but they do account for um, various economic conditions, um, different pop sizes, population sizes, and things like that. Um, and so there is a lot that is controlled for um, in these studies. And so um, you know, you can expect this average effect to occur, you know, on average, but of course there are going to be some, some fluctuations. And that's why with our calculator, we say this is an order of magnitude um, estimate. Uh, that being said, we, we are conservative um, with our, with the shift calculator and the NCSC California calculator. We use a, a lower elasticity 0.75 for um, class two and three facilities. So other other highways and um, arterials. Uh, the, the, the research indicates that there might be a slightly lower elasticity on those facilities. Um, so we use that there um, to be conservative. And, and just on the point of contextual differences, I will say that if you're thinking, okay, maybe there's gonna be a higher elasticity in very congested areas um, versus non-congested areas, well, the, the most congested areas tend to have the greatest VMT density. So 
you're so if you have a one point elasticity you, you have a one mile a, a one lane mile addition in a very congested area you're going to get a whole lot more induced bmt than you are in in most rural areas um and so the elasticity might not be different but the amount of VMT that you're inducing is different. And, and that's taken into account by the, the way the calculator works using elasticity, using existing lane miles and existing, um, existing VMT. And I, and I will say too, there's not been a lot of, of research done on comparing rural areas to, to metro areas, um, but there is evidence that induced travel happens in rural areas too and not uh, with not much less of, uh, of an elasticity. Um, because there hasn't been as much evidence there, we don't suggest applying the calculator to rural areas, but that's not to say we don't, wouldn't expect induced travel in those areas. Whenever you're making a trip easier, faster, a little safer, um, you're going to get some kind of in, induced travel. It may not be a lot, but um, depending on the existing VMT, but we, we, we would expect induced travel in those situations. Hey, uh, Jamie, so, um, you know, a lot of this is stemming from the issue of congestion and how DOTS or, you know, uh, transportation projects are, are trying to answer our question or solve our question of, of congestion. Your example of, you know, going from Davis to Sacramento and, um, and so what is, is Caltrans with their kind of uh, new policy or what they're trying to work with? Are they trying to educate people, uh, both the public, um, like your yourself and your example, or you know businesses and industry around the concept of um, induced travel and what it's trying to solve or not trying to solve by doing these type of projects? Yeah, so I, I haven't I haven't seen outreach efforts um, towards individuals or businesses, um, but. But the goal is to get these analyses into the environmental review documents, into the cost benefit analyses, so that induced travel, the full accounting, um, is taken into consideration when deciding where to put your, your uh, transportation financing dollars um, and, and how to structure these projects. And, and so I, I think as we see induced travel being incorporated into these um, analyses, you know, public reads those, they comment on those. And so we're gonna start seeing it spreading out um, to, to greater segments of the population. And um, if that's internalized, then we might see growing advocacy for alternatives to transit, um, work from home maybe, um, to the extent that can reduce VMT uh, active travel. Um, so yeah, we're, I think we're at the initial stages, but um, I think this the Caltrans recognition of induced travel could start seeing a lot of um, public information benefits as, as these analyses become more public. So there's a couple questions um, about whether or not the calculator, or if you've seen attempts beyond your calculator um, to look at improvements um, such as interchange improvements, as opposed to just adding lanes. Yeah, so that's, that's another, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, this calculator and the induced travel research I was referencing just looks at where there's a physical capacity expansion. So it doesn't, it doesn't look at kind of the intelligent transportation system, different ways of managing roadways within the same, um, with this, with this, with this name physical network. So that is another area where we, we need more more research to see what the what the effect is going to be um, on VMT. Yeah, so I think there were actually three questions, um, Myron, Tim, and Tom, about that. So if so, the types of improvements that might shorten travel time, but without a physical expansion, really, is um, what's not covered that we need more research on, is what I'm hearing. So right, and right. and I think even with those, if we are in, in, in increasing or reducing the travel time, reducing the cost of driving, you're probably gonna see some type of in induced travel effect there. Um, sure. So it, maybe it's gonna be more localized if you're, if it's a you know local improvements on a, on a local network, but in that case, maybe you're, you're 
just taking away from active travel trips or something like that. So I think there would be some induced travel, but yeah, we don't have a great amount of research on that to know what the magnitude of it would be. Well, Jamie, uh, I hate to do this. It is the end of the webinar. I know we could, I would, could talk to you for another hour about this. I, I find it extremely fascinating and the work that you've done has is, is been uh, great. So, uh, so this concludes the, uh, this uh, seminar and after the seminar ends, you'll have an opportunity to do a, complete a brief survey. So we really hope that you'll be able to uh, do that. It only takes a couple of minutes and we appreciate your feedback. So thanks again to Jamie and for all of you to uh, join us and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.